In succession, Dame Harriet Walter plays Lady Caroline Collingwood, the prickly ex-wife of magnate Laban Roy and distant matriarch of the damaged Roy family. I'm Rob LeCurry, a senior editor at Gold Derby. I'm here with Emmy-nominated legend herself. Congratulations on your first nomination for the show, Harriet. How exciting. It really is, yes. It's another world out there, the Emmy Awards. Yeah, and it's the first time for you, right? First time, and it just seems like a bit virtual. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because we won't see you on any red carpets or you know anything like that this year, unfortunately. But, um, you know, it'll be a virtual ceremony. And uh, after, like, so many years on stage and screen, it's just... I had to look it up. I didn't realise this was your first ever nomination. Where were you when you found out? Uh, in the bath, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All my emails in the bath. <laughs> no, um, I, I think I was sort of near to that, in the morning anyway. And uh, I heard it from my American agent, so that was lovely to hear. Um, I, I, you know, just totally, I'm in semi-disbelief as, as I speak to you now because, you know, I've managed to get through life with relatively few awards, actually, but I have not stopped working. So it hasn't made a big, you know, of course, I've sometimes thought, huh, when I got left out. But, you know, basically, they are, to me, awards are a way of saying we didn't forget you this year, you know, because it's such an ephemeral art form that it's very easy to forget with all the stuff going on you know it's very hard to get your head above the parapet so it's great to be in a show that in itself is so unforgettable you know that, yeah um, like i last year i actually thought huh when i didn't see you in the list of the guest acting uh race and so it was nice that they decided you know what we're going to give you one this year because we think you deserve it it was very good to see yeah. um you, you know i um i think this is going to be hard for me to explain, but for me, Succession lives in that sweet spot, that same sweet spot that is inhabited by some of the best plays and works of fiction, like um, King Lear and Titus Andronicus. And I was just wondering, given your illustrious career on stage with the Royal Shakespeare Company, do you think it's a fair comparison to make between this really modern show and those iconic classics? I think it. I think I. I think we can draw that parallel. Um, because it's got, I mean, let's face it, if it was just about that particular, particular family, why would we be interested? It's really because they're iconic and because we can relate them to various kind of empires we know of, you know, um, that are also run by families. Um, we can see that there is a sort of classic, um, you know, eternal story there. And... I think we are interested in those things, you know, that we're interested, it's very Shakespearean to kind of clash history and um, the inevitability of power with individual people who, are, who have real emotions and are really caught up in it. Um, that's absolutely, that's to me, that's the sort of ingredients for the great drama, really. Yeah, I like that. Those dynastic politics and uh, the, you know the the ambitious yearning of these desperate, damaged people. And then when we finally get to London and we see uh, Caroline, and she's we we see why these people are the way they are. And I'm wondering when you uh, signed on for the role and started receiving scripts for her, what was going through your mind about trying to trying to portray this woman? Did you set up your own backstory, or was it kind of given to you? No, I very much set up my own, but with, you know, I, I conferred with Jesse Armstrong. I sort of said, I, I've had this kind of thought and that kind of thought. Um, but, I mean, when you say we, you know, it, you know, when you meet her, you understand how, you know, she sort of explains how they turned out the way they did. I'm going, I've heard that remark a lot, but I'm going, hang on, why doesn't Logan explain yeah. those children as well you know it's always like <laughs> yeah. chef de la femme and i'm going wait a minute you know it takes two to create three monsters and um <laughs> and yes of course she was drawn to him in the first place by you know i've invented my backstory really of, of somebody brought up in a very sort of um sort of county english world where there weren't many thrills and she took to drugs and drink and kind of got wild and wanted some adventure and some fun and to live on the high end. And for that, you know, she was very attracted to Logan. 
and his lifestyle. Um, but you have to look at the age span between the three children and realize she must have stuck it out for at least seven, eight years, you know, and, and reared them or sent them off to nannies, but at least she was in the household. And, um, you know, we see her very much ejected from the family fold. Now you could interpret that in many ways. You could either say she left or she was kicked out yeah. or she'd like to see more of the children, but she's not allowed to, or she couldn't give a toss about the children. And, you know, you can make up your own mind because I have my theory, but unless it's written in and demonstrated, I can't really tell you what that is. No. So, um, yes, I've got my theories, but I am always interested to hear this thing of, oh, it's so great because now we know why they are the way they are when we see you. And I go, well, they are the way they are also because they've been the children of Logan Roy. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen how he treats them and plays them off against one another. And you think, well, what would it be like to be married to him? You know? Yeah. It would be a nightmare, I, I would assume, because uh, he's monstrous. He's so outwardly monstrous, authoritarian, tough as nails. But uh, I think what I mainly mean is it gave us another dimension when we saw that C Caroline is obviously softer um, and probably not as outwardly monstrous as he is, but has her own shortcomings, which they all do. She is like emotionally distant. She's a bit withholding obviously, as I said earlier, a bit prickly. And I found that so interesting because, the, but there was still this warmth to her. And I'm, I'm, I assume you are playing that because she's still in some way maternal, but she's de dealing with her own stuff, which you keep her. Yes, I mean, I think she's, she sort of knows how to superficially look loving and, yeah. and say loving things. But when push comes to shove, she can't take it and she runs away. Um, I think she's incredibly defensive, which is, parallel to your word prickly um and you kind of think well why is it a kind of i'm going to get them before they get me or is it you know is it is it a lifetime of defending herself against you know maybe her parents were like you know not great examples um and you know she's out in that fish tank and she or shark tank and so you know there's the you, you sink or swim and i'm not saying she was in any way some sort of innocent virgin who got perverted <laughs> i think i think she was always a bit of a nightmare person but um you know i think she rather bit off more than she could chew and kind of i think she's trying to salvage something in her life um and feels thank god i got out of there but yeah. at the same time i think i mean i was thinking of the sort of the 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 Getty story, you know, when the with both those the series and also the the movie, all the all the money in the world or whatever, yeah, where you know the divorcee is actually forbidden access to the children who are the grandchildren of the of the of the mm. of the patriarch, um, because my line, my bloodline, has to be under my roof, you know. Um, and you, she wolf, can get out, you know. And I felt it was very much that was the dynamic I imagined. And in that scenario, there's a certain amount of well, I don't want to be with you anyway, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But there's also a kind of I would love to see you for Christmas. But then it's kind of undercut by I'm going to show your father up. I'm going to show you what your father's made of, you know. So there's this sort of battle being fought over, you know, yeah. over the over the Atlantic via the children. Yeah, and it's still going, which uh, which I found really uh, delightful to watch, to be honest. Uh, the episode seven called Return is the episode submitted for your performance. Um, and uh, in that, the children come over to London to see if they can persuade their mother to um, kind of give up or pay out her shareholding. But that all leads to that conversation about, well, look, uh, you know, I'll give you what you want, but I want to see the kids every Christmas. And we are left wondering, does she actually really want to spend time with these people <laughs> I mean, she's going to hell. <laughs> she'll probably do a runner at christmas you yeah. Know? yeah um or deliberately break her leg in a skiing accident so she does <laughs> there'll be some there'll be some escape route but i think she's genuinely for who wouldn't be fond of her children she's not completely unnatural but yeah. i think she you know they're grown up and they can fight for themselves and you know she's probably just um you know, she's lost a certain battle, but she also just has too much pride to 
kind of beg. Um, and I also think that, you know, she, she, she is and she isn't softer. What I like about her, um, you know, one, quite often I've been offered roles that, and I've quite often turned down roles that are just nasty pieces of work. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't see the joy in that. But a nasty piece of work who's complicated and funny. Yeah. And seems to enjoy being a bit nasty. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, there's something about her. Um, I think she's, you know, in season one, it was very clear that she would, you know, she's terrified. This whole bunch comes to have their wedding, it's Shiv's wedding. And, you know, her, her ex and his new wife are there and this that and the other you know so she's really prickly at that situation in that situation and she you know I suddenly thought well this is her defense mechanism she hates being bored she hates you know she wants to kick kick the dust up you know yeah she, she just doesn't want to be bored I think she's terrified of being alone with herself in a room and having to listen to her own oh I'm such a horrible person so she's out there kind of you know, like she says to Shiv, you know, I'm just trying to break the ice. I'm just, you know, it's just a joke, you know. Um, it's kind of the way she operates. She just doesn't want to be bored. <laughs> yeah, it's a survival mechanism. And, and that leads me to this because the scene between you and Jeremy Strong, when he is obviously dealing with some very difficult, heartbreaking stuff and he goes to his mum, like, you know, a lot of us would do that and hoping for some kind of solace. And most people want to concentrate on how on how Caroline recoils and kind of escapes. But I would I was more interested in those very fleeting moments where I could actually see that she really does want to be there for him, but she's just not capable. So many of us have that dysfunction. And I found that it was very quick, but it was very interesting. What what do you say about that? There's a, these terrible ruts we get into in families. These, and you you try and pull yourself out of this rut, but it's just so deeply habit formed. You know that she's she's had this distance from them for so long. It's not like he's confided in her much before. It's not like there's a route in that they always go, and she knows how to drive through it. And Plus, she doesn't know the scenario. I mean, the audience knows what's distressing him. She doesn't quite know, but she senses it's something a bit deep. And she's going, oh, I don't know if I can handle deep, you know. Um, but she, and it's just, there's a gulf that's grown up over several years. You know, it's long time since she sort of cuddled him or, or and she probably was never terribly good at dealing with emotions anyway. But I think that's what's, you know, it's like a sort of terror of getting close yeah. to anybody, um, yeah. which is partly supposed to be our national disease, um, which I do kind of understand. And I've grown up with a certain amount of that. But um, so I don't have to look far for my, my models for this character um, um, in my own sort of surroundings. But I think that's what it is. She does have that awful sort of yearning and if she was talking to her friend she'd say I adore my children you know and the last thing she kisses the top of his head and says um my lovely boy or something yeah. it's something very affectionate yeah so she knows how to go through the motions but she can't actually do it and she doesn't know what it will be and you know he's, he's kind of Kendall's quite the sort of complicated guy yeah and there was a scene that didn't didn't get into the final cut in season one where we had a little duo scene where it's very evident that Kendall has a lot of anger against his mother and sort of as the oldest son blames her for a lot of you know maybe he got brunt of the divorce because he was the most aware of what was going on um and you know I was trying to push in a little bit of it takes two. Don't just blame your mother. Um, and that scene didn't make it into the final cut, sadly, because I suppose it wasn't absolutely vital to the forward thrust of the plot. But I experienced that scene and remembered that scene and it fed into a bit of the history behind that. But, you know, um, here's this guy who has been pretty angry with me in the past 
And I think she says something is, you know, have you got over your, you know, is it something you're going to blame me for again? You know, yeah. so that's what she immediately assumes when he says, can we talk? She thinks she's going to be in for a, a bit of blame and a bit of reckoning that yeah. she can't quite face. And I think that is part of it as well. Completely forgot about that line. And that goes back to this defense thing that she's constantly got these walls. This is such a common thing in families. It's a very common dynamic. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many of us fans relate to the show. Speaking of though, um, and I've asked this of most of the cast that I've spoken to, Succession is about repugnant and unlikable one percenters and kind of rich people and people who are not very nice for whatever reason though i want to be around them i care about them i want to watch them why why do you think we all love this show so much god it, um, kendall particularly breaks my heart there's something and and actually they all do in a way because they all need love yeah. they're all desperate for love and you know, you can see that, that, that there, is, there is space in the writing and in, in all the sort of incidents within the plots, the, com the competition between them and all that drives them is to somehow get daddy's, you know, affection, yeah. love, admiration. I don't think they're fighting necessarily for, you know, the crown jewels of, of the empire and who's going to inherit. I think they're fighting for daddy's attention and daddy's love and daddy's kind of um you know okay you're an all right person which is crazy but it's what they've grown up with so i think we relate to their need for love and that's what breaks our heart yeah yeah i never thought of it that way and it's very interesting because that is that's so universal um now let's move off succession for a bit before we let you go if you don't mind me asking because i always I, whenever i speak to somebody who's been um, gained or knighted, I don't know the exact term, I'm a citizen of the Commonwealth, I should know better. Um, what is it, how is one informed that you're about to be appointed a Dane Commander of the Order of the British Empire? How does that work? Like, and, and talk us through that whole moment in your life. I think you get, a, you get a letter. I got a phone call from my agent saying you've had a letter um, that says, would you agree to be a Dane if it was offered to you? Wow. Well, basically, you're in the pipeline for an honour, but they don't want to offer it you if you're going to say, listen, I don't want it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, uh, not, they're not going to offer it to you. But they have offered it to you, and yeah. you have the option to say, I don't think I will accept it. They don't want you to kind of publicly reject it at the last moment yeah, in, okay. in view of the whole public. So they prepare themselves as to whether you're going to accept it or not. And you're given a few months before it becomes public knowledge. So, you know, my first reaction, of course, was I'm going to be really right on and turn it down. Of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an egalitarian. I don't believe in inequality. I don't believe it. You know. um, yeah. And then I thought, you know what? All the guys in my profession, when they get to a certain age, they get offered a knighthood. Hmm. And part of it is because they've had the access to the roles that will keep them in the profession for decades. And I want to say, come on, let's hear it for the dames, you know. And I suddenly sort of, my egalitarian credentials went down the tube, my feminist credentials dominated. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I just think, because like, as an Australian Republican, not to be confused with the American version, I would never ever accepted such a thing, but as soon as I got that letter, I'd be running around screaming and, ca and carrying <laughs> an awful lot of dames in Australia. You have a hell of a lot of dames in Australia. I know, I know. So, uh, and they're all how, beautiful. They're brilliant. all, yeah, of course. Um, final question before we let you go is that um, we, we got to see another side of you this season as well as Dasha on, um, on Killing Eve. In fact, you've been on a lot of TV lately, which is really exciting to me that, um, because you know, I, I know that TV can actually afford um, actors and performers some really interesting meat to kind of chew on. But in Killing Eve, I was not expecting that from you at all. And I loved the character. And I wonder uh, what drew you to her, and particularly the scene where you get to um, pitchfork Nico in the neck in Poland. I thought that was the highlight <laughs> of the scene. <laughs> I don't think I've ever killed anyone on screen before. So that was, you know, that was a novelty. I also had to learn a bunch of Polish phonetically, which was wow. tricky. Um, well, I think because the series was kind of being written as we went along, 
And the showrunner had conceived this character and thought, I've got to get this character in somewhere. I've had a dream and this is this wonderful character. And I got this breakdown of who she was and it was really fascinating. But she was supposed to have trained Villanelle. So at some point before it was all written, I said, well, you know, I've watched the series so much. I, I've studied Jodie. I know how she behaves. Would it not be the case that most of what she does, I taught her? You know, um, I, I would have trained her up in all her accents and her this isn't that. And, you know, I thought, come on, I want to show off a bit. You know, I, I, I can um, speak various languages and put on accents and disguises. So let me get to do a bit of it. And I think that penny dropped and they thought, right, we're going to send her on a mission in disguise and um, be this old Polish person <laughs> who plunges a pitchfork into someone's neck. I thought it was very, very like, I mean, my uncle was Christopher Lee, the horror film yeah. artist. And I watched that episode back and thought, I look just like my uncle when I'm about to, yes. you know, do the thing. The same and thing. Teeth into necks. I'm plunging yes. pitchforks into necks. Um, wonderful. Hmm. But, uh, oh, yeah, I'm just glad we got to see it. And I sort of thought the same thing. Like, oh, my God, the family resemblance is there. That's quite scary. <laughs> um, but, yeah, look, anyway, Harry, we could talk to you. I could talk to you all day. But unfortunately, the time is up. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck at the Thank end. Thank you. You have a nice day. I will. And everybody go to Gold Derby, make your predictions, click subscribe, and watch all of our great contender chats, just like this one with Harry. Mm -hmm.